You know, we haven't won a world championship in a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh, well, you all, everyone, the New Yorkers and Chicagoans are going to win a world championship one day soon. The Jets? Yeah, right. Okay. Thanks. We're going to cook a couple dishes. This is one of the most delicious vegetables in the world, watercress. Everyone knows watercress, right? Number one consumer watercress in the world is us Chinese. We're 1.4 billion, so that's not that hard. We saute it. It's actually a great test for a wok cook if they can saute watercress and not have it, have it shiny and glistening, but not have it leach water, because a bad wok cook doesn't know how to do it. A good wok cook is just glistening. It's a great test. Number two country, not per person, but which country in the world eats more watercress? Number two in the world after China. Not USA. England, because of the bloody tea sandwiches. That's my best freaking British accent ever. Not so good, I know. Sounds Australian. There's something called the NDI, Nutritional Density Index. Kale and watercress are the only two vegetables in the world that bat a thousand on it. Healthiest vegetable in the world, period. And it's so good for you. Natural antioxidant, we actually make watercress pills. Full disclosure, I work with a company called B&W. They're in Vero Beach. They have 80% market share of watercress in this, in this, uh, in this country. So they do a lot of watercress. And one of the coolest things about it is they actually, when you grow watercress, and I didn't know this, so I'm making a, a, a scallion watercress pancake, all right? When you grow watercress, you have to grow it with running water. So they have farms starting in Vero Beach going all the way up the, the eastern seaboard. So when they start growing watercress in early spring, they grow it. They have like, I was there filming, they have like 60 or 70 farmers all from Mexico, literally whistling. They were happy to be there, they were paid well, they had air conditioning, uh, housing, they got to go home for Christmas, so just really well taken care of, which is important in my eyes, right? The, as a company, you should have your employees that are happy. But it's so cool, because after the watercress grows, it takes about four weeks, they whack it, and then once it gets too hot, <clears throat> they gotta move north. So they literally pack up in air-conditioned, um, trucks and air-conditioned buses, they bring all the farmers to the mo the, a more north farm, and then they bring watercress, the last heart, and they spread it out like Jesus did. And they just throw watercress everywhere, and it, that takes, and that starts growing. And it's running water, right? It's just a lightly graded field, one acre field. From the water table, water comes up, and then water goes down. They do this, it gets too hot, they go all the way up to the northern farm. By the time it gets too cold, they come back down, to Vero Beach, start over again. The water table has come back to where it started, if not more. So zero water consumption to grow watercress. Pretty cool, right? There's no other plant in the world that does that either. So it's really good for you and it's great for the planet. And it's practically free. Okay, that's a lie, it's not free. But if you buy a lot of watercress, my children may go to college. So there's that. All right, hot water dough. Hot water dough is pretty simple. Hot water flour, right? This is the classic dough you use to make scallion pancakes and pot stickers. You need a KitchenAid, because you just need a KitchenAid, because it looks so cool in your kitchen. But this, this standing mixer, of all the products in the world that more people recognize, is probably a KitchenAid standing mixer. And it's because it works so well. I, mean, I, I, have, I have a lot of them, um, not because one has ever broken. I've never had one break, which is a hell of a testament. I've been a chef for probably actually 40 years exactly. So, all right, so as you can tell, it's boiling water. So that water starts actually cooking the gluten. This dough will get, it will eventually come together. You then are going to knead it. Really hard to knead boiling water dough, right? I don't care how strong you are. Um, you can see it's starting to come together. You can go a little faster. Can I what? Can I do a gluten-free version? Um, not today. Um, you can. You could use brown rice and white rice flour. It'd just be, it'd be more mochi-like, right? And so, honestly, I would add, I would add like more veg or something to make it softer because you know mochi's. Whoa, hello, nice to see you. Um, so yeah, 
Thomas Keller actually makes a pretty good gluten-free flour that you probably could do. Actually, you know what? I tried it. I was in Montana. I did make it with this, with this gluten-free flour. It was pretty good. It was more cakey. All right. So this is pretty good. All right. So. Let's put it on this board here. Hey, grab this for me. Thank you. So a little bench flour. Take the dough out. It's pretty warm. You got to just, you have to work it, right? Classic bread technique, push it out, bring it back. And you have to let it rest, right? This dough's tired, right? And I would normally do this for probably about, I don't know, four minutes just to really knead it well. But then you really want to mold it, get it nice and soft into a glass bowl or a stainless steel bowl, cover it and let it rest because it, you can't roll it out when it's this hot, right? I don't know how it jumped back in the bowl, but it did. All right, so now you just roll it out. Who's good with a knife? You are you? Come on, come up here. Are you good, really? I mean, you cut your finger off, dude. I'm never coming back. So are you good? Is he? All right, come on up here. Come around. Here, catch. <laughs> What's your name? Connor. Ming Sai. Nice to see you. So I want you to slice some scallions for me, right? So, okay, let me see. You say you go with that? Let me see you. Let me see how you hold it. How do you do? Okay, stop. Stop. Right there. Grab a knife with your thumb and your finger. You should be able to do all the cutting. God gave us three other fingers as they come along, but never this. That's the rookie. So grab it that way, which is why the tang's that way. Okay? Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Dad, you lied. You lied, dude. Okay. That's one way to do it if you want to get chopped. You slide your knife through, and it's your left hand that matters, right? You got to do the crab's claw. Okay? Slowly. See that? I'm at least an inch away from my scallions. This is a really sharp knife, as you can tell, right? I mean, look how sharp this knife is. Oop, that didn't quite work. Here we go. That's a sharp knife, right? So slow. Can you do that? Slow. Not this Iron Chef crap you were just doing. <laughs> really slow. Okay, you got to get your fingers back. There you go. Okay. So, 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 okay, stop. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Okay. Thank you. Dude, 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 you're all right. I don't know how you do it. I'm actually Jewish, so I don't know how to do it, but. All right, so in all seriousness, that's how you grab a knife, guys, right? Never this, that's rookie, you can slip and then you can catch the side of your fingers. You always grab this. I can slice without my three fingers, right? I don't need those. They're there to help me control the knife. And the most important thing with the knife is you don't grab it like this. If you're grabbing your knife like this, you're gonna cut yourself. Have a cocktail. Relax. I mean, who plays golf? Who plays any sport? Can you hit a golf ball if you grab your club like this? No way. Relax in the hand. Squash, tennis, a whole nine yards. And the key is this hand. This is really bad. This is like fingernail in. Crab's claw. So the fingers are always here. My knife can touch my fingers, right? It's touching here, which is why I don't bring it all the way up, because then I'll slice my fingers off, right? Or my knuckles off. But the key is this, which is why I can feel it coming. It's why, ah, just kidding. It's why I don't have to look. Because every time, the closest my fingers are to the blade is about an inch away, right? What was your name again? Okay. If you work for free for me for 12 years, I'll hire you. I'll feed you. I mean, rice. Cooked. All right. So these bad boys are going to go a little bit smaller. The white part is much stronger than the green part, right, flavor-wise? So usually they're perfectly round. This got banged up a little bit, but it'll still work. All right. So that's the scallion part of the scallion pancake. The watercress part. Super salty water. I'll need more salt, guys. It should, um, 
should taste like seawater, right? I'm always dipping my fingers in spoiling water at work because it, it matters. It matters what things taste like. It matters what your water tastes like. So when you blanch something, it's not only seasoned, it stays green. Bring it back to a boil. Always add salt to boiling water. We spend a lot of money on beautiful pans. If you put salt water in cold water, that salt can pill the bottom of your pan. You just lost a nice $200 pan, right? You want to bring it back to a boil. Two seconds, literally. And one thing I like, I can get a little bit more. How long is this demo? Two hours? How long is it? Half an hour, 45? 45? Oh, so slow down. And then the rabbi walked into McDonald's. So you see how much greener? I mean, water because it's already green, but when it hits salted water, it gets even greener. It's just the chlorophyll, which is awesome. So I'm just blanching it just to give it a nice salty. There's a great Korean dish, and I'm Chinese, but I love Korean food. I love all food, obviously, and people for that matter. Um, they have a great watercress salty dish that's just chopped up watercress that has salt and a little bit of sesame oil. It's so good, uh, so good for you. I'm a big believer that you are what you eat. I didn't make up that expression, but it's so true. And if you eat four Big Macs a day, you're a Big Mac. It's that simple. It's like, I don't know why I look like this. Well, you eat four Big Macs a day. All right, so squeeze the water out. You could shock this in cold water. That's all right. It'll, it'll cool off for me. Actually, you know what? Let's do a shock. Let's give it a quick shock. We have, oh, we have it there. Well, <laughs> you're just watching me? Pretty much. You got two hours. I got two hours. Good. All right, this is easy because I was going to. You really want this dry. If you add wet watercress to a scallion pancake, you're done. So. This would really hurt if you threw it at someone's face. Right, catch? No. All right, thank you. Grazie. Yeah. So then we'll chop up. Isn't it amazing all that watercress came out to this? Right, almost nothing. Then we're gonna chop up this watercress. All right. Fantastic. So we'll make our pancake, then we're gonna fill it with that stuff. First, going to take one piece, like that big. Lay you here. More bench flour. Right, and then you just roll it out. You got to use it, it's sticky, so you have to have the flour. I need, uh, is there sesame oil here? I saw it somewhere. Oh, it's over there. It's behind me. Sesame and regular oil, please. Should be behind me. Perfect. Thank you. So the idea of making any pastry or any dough thing, you're trying to create layers, right? So in puff pastry, pat friete, croissants, you're layering, you're folding in butter, you're folding, folding, folding. Us Chinese and us, most of us Asians, we, ne we were never that strong in pastries, one, because we never really had butter, right? We really didn't have cows in China. Uh, we do now. So one way of creating layers is rolling and twisting like a strudel or a stru uh, strudel. So sesame oil, grapeseed oil, okay, salt, and rub. So I want oil to go all the way to the edges all right, with salt. 50 watercress, 50 scallions. Scallions everywhere. My grandfather used to make this with raw beef, best. And he'd cook up these big old thick bings, as he called them. And I don't mind it when you roll it and you cook it, a little bit of the scallions and watercress comes out, because then you can see what's in it. Um, and then sometimes the scallions get a little burnt. All right, so then what we do, can I see this all right? Hello. So then you roll it. Okay. So right now we're creating layers, right? Roll. So now there's layers on top of each other. All right. Then if you twist it opposite ways, you're creating more layers, right? 
does creating around itself. Okay. Then you bring one end and you bring it around. Then you tuck the other end back. Okay. Pretty simple. And if you're doing a party, you can, you can have them to this point, or you can have them all the way rolled out. And you'll see when I roll out, you need a little bit more flour because some of the oil is going to come out now. You're going to see that some of the scallions will break the dough, which is fine. And some of the watercress will break out as well. But we created about 12 layers, right, by rolling it around itself, by twisting it, and then by rolling it on itself one more time. All right? So that's about what you're looking for. You don't need a nonstick, but nonsticks are so great now these days, right? Um, there's a great blue diamond coating that I just, uh, actually, who has a date at midnight this Sunday? Or who wants a date with me at midnight this Sunday? Okay, you're pretty cute, sir. Um, oh, I just wanted a water. Um, all right, well, you can't really have it with me, but if you turn on HSN at midnight, I will smile when I go like this, I was saying hi to you. Okay? Just remember, that's just you. No one else. No, not of the other people. And I'm excited because I'm selling this uh, blue diamond coating, right? Ceramic has been the hottest coating for the longest time. Blue diamond, diamond is, is going to be the next great thing. And it works so well. Um, so check that out at midnight. Or all day Monday because no one works Mondays, right? So not a ton of oil. About a tablespoon, right? And like french fries, the most important thing is salt it when it comes out. So we're going to go G, B, and D. Can I get a little more chicken stock, please? All right. Can you guys see this pan fine? So the second dish, as my scallion pancakes cooking, is a crispy skin salmon. Smell your fish, right? It should smell like the sea. If it smells fishy, Move on. Do this with Whole Foods. Do this at your fishmonger. Ask them to put fish on a piece of paper and smell it. If they don't let you do that, move on. Go eat meatloaf, right? Seriously. It can't smell like fishy. It has to smell, it has to smell like the sea. So we're going to do a crispy skin. Thank you. Um, can I have more salt? I, oh, there we go. I got it right here. So, double season on the salt side, right? This is twice the amount because I'm not going to season the other side. Why? Because I kind of want it's not going to really be a salt crust, but it's going to be a good salty crust. And so when you eat it, as long as you eat every bite with the skin, it's perfect, all right? So then, just skin side down. I went to a restaurant called Trois Marches. Um, 25 years ago. It's, it's a most beautiful restaurant outside of Versailles in France. It was a two-star Michelin restaurant back then. My father and I had this salmon gros sel, and they cooked this beautiful piece of salmon, just the, the fleur de sel, or gros sel, sel gris, perfectly crispy and cooked from well done to raw. So your bite was medium rare. It was amazing, right? So it's literally still cool on top, but fully cooked on the bottom. So if you eat normal salmon, it's normal. But I don't eat raw salmon. But when you take a bite of that, it's incredible. All right. So this is my blender. Kitchen makes the most tight cover, which is awesome if you're blending stuff that's hot or whatnot because you don't want it to pop off, right? But I'm going to do a technique. Hey, can you lose this KitchenAid mixer for me? Put it in my car. Thank you. Oh, my dim sum dipper? Thank you. So that's going to probably be too much soy sauce for my dim sum dipper, but I'll show you what we do. Okay, one, just one small bowl to mix the dim sum dipper in, please. All right, so here we have some chicken stock that, has, that started with a bunch of caramelized onions and garlic. This has been super reduced. I reduced it so much, I almost reduced all the stock out. So what I'm going to make is a watercress nage. This is the easiest sauce you'll ever make and so delicious. So again, caramelized onions and garlic, 
deglazed chicken stock. This was like this full of chicken stock, so I reduce it down to like a chicken stock royale, if you would. Thank you. And here quickly is a dim sum dipper for the scallion pancakes, which is so simple. Scallions. Sambal. La Jiao. Any Chinese out there? La Jiao? Yeah, okay, good. That means men's room, but it doesn't. It means that. Uh, natural boot soy sauce. One part of that to three parts of vinegar. I don't like when they're too, too salty. This is spicy. This you can make. We have quarts of this in our fridge at home. The scallions get soft. It, it, could last for a, it could last for a year if you don't do this. If you don't introduce bacteria from a finger, your ketchup, your mustard, your mayonnaise will last for a year. If you ever put your finger in anything, in jams and peanut butter and chutney, once you introduce bacteria, I don't care how clean you are, no one's clean enough, then bacteria forms, right? So that's a dim sum dipper. Let's see how this is doing. It's probably pretty good. Whoa! All right. So the, and that, that's a great tip there. If you want to flip stuff, it's better to have a saute pan that has the sloped edge at 45 degrees, because I tried to flip it, you saw I struggled a little bit. But that's what you're looking for, GB and D, right? Golden brown, delicious. All right, so this salmon is, I'm turning this off, because right now this salmon, to me, is almost perfect. Right? I want to get that nice and crispy, but I don't want to overcook it. So I'm just going to let this salmon go. And not cover it. If you cover it, then it's going to get opaque and the top will cook. That's not my goal. My goal is to have it so rare. All right, so here we have some hot broth. And here's a trick. So, start your blender on low. If you're going to use, if you're going to add hot liquid, make sure the blender's running, right? And don't put your, don't put your face right next to it because a little bit will splatter. But with it running, what you don't want to do what you don't want to do is put hot liquid in, put the cover on, and then turn it on. Because then you'll build up pressure and the whole thing could pop off in your face, right? So I'm just going, I don't mind this little bit of splatter. Because once you have liquid, it stops. So I was making the point, if you only put a little bit, it splatters. If you get it all in there, it does that. Then when I want to go heavy, I put the cover on. Okay? Now. The sauce. So simple. Again, this is only chicken stock with onions and garlic. Tons of watercress. And because it's hot, it cooks it instantly, right? And it'll start getting nice and green. And if you want to get vegetables into your body, you make this you'll get a lot of water crisps into your body. All right, see how great that looks? Butter, you have to use butter, right? It's just better. Just one or two packs. You leave one or two pats. I encourage you all come and try this. This is going to be the best thing you've ever had. Maybe not in your life, because you might have gone to Gold Coast Dogs earlier. That is so noisy. But look how beautiful this is. You could, I trained in France, right? I like butter. You could have easily done just two pats of butter, but you won't have this. Look at that, guys. So it's part nage. Technically, this is called a nage in French, which is a reduced stock, a reduced syrup, monte au beurre. But look at that color, right? And that is what we're talking about for crispy skin salmon, OK? Just like that.
This is country food, guys. Anyone can do this. We have a lemon? Yes. You mind? Thanks. All right, we're going to come over here and finish my scallion pancake. Move aside. Any questions? It can be political, it can be about gay rights, abortion, anything PC. Shall we? Transgender? It doesn't matter, guys. Me too, when Ming too, us too, all of us too. That's my movement. When you Let's first go. put the salmon in the pan, is it at a high flame or a medium while you're cooking? I it? start on a high and then I turn it down low. So right now it's really, I mean, it's, so it's, it's I just, it's, it's now really hot. It's off. Uh, but start high. Um, but if you ever turn a pan on, you got to get oil in it, any pan, right? Never crank a pan high flame and leave it. Go watch, you know, Dancing with the Stars and come back. Although we love that because then you'll buy another pan. A question here with your yeah. biggest fan next to her. He has a picture on his shirt, by the way. So when you Oh my God, you have me on your shirt, dude? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Is that you in it too? Yeah, at the culinary cooking festival. My name's Blake, if you remember me. Oh yeah, Blake. Where's my shirt? <laughs> I have a Blake shirt underneath this. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, when you put the salmon in, in the uh, water chest sauce, did the heat cook the top of the salmon? When you put the the heat, yeah, you can see right here how the heat's coming up to the top. Yeah. No, this is still raw, right? Yeah. And this is actually still just lightly warm which is what I want. When, you put it when I flip it over, the, the heat of the soup will continue cooking, 100%. Honestly, if I was eating it, I would, I would actually, <laughs> I would act, if I was eating this at home, I'd be dipping it in the thing to keep it raw and keep it crispy, keep it hot. I would never, I just spent so much time crisping up the skin to put that in the, in the nodule would be silly, right? Because first of all, the skin is the part of the healthiest part. It is the fattiest, but that's why you're eating it because of the, you know, raising your good cholesterol. Um, but there's so much flavor in the skin. Yeah, but it does. A good question. It does continue cooking. Another question. I mean, what do you think about good quality farm-raised salmon, how to find it versus wild-raised or wild-caught? It's a great question. Can I have a, um, yeah, thanks, and a little ramkin. So, question about salmon. There are two places in the world that farm-raised the best salmon in the world, Faroe Islands and Norway, that I've seen. I know Scotland does it too, this is by personal experience. When you, thank God there's farm-raised fish, trout and salmon being the two biggest, with shrimp being the biggest shellfish. If we didn't have farm-raised seafood, we would have no fish and seafood left in the sea. Not a chance on earth, right? 98% of all shrimp is farm-raised. A lot of it in Asia, you see it at Whole Foods, defrosted beautiful things of shrimp, they've all been frozen. All of it's been frozen, they just lay them out and they're fresh, but they're frozen which is good because shrimp when it's frozen in its natural environment, Contessa used to do this, and I don't work with Contessa, but I, I know how they do it. They used to use uh, uh, nitrogen gas to freeze it. It kept the juice and the flavor in the shrimp, so when defrosted, they're still perfect. Farm raising, when they do it well, there's a national decree in both Norway and Faroe Islands how you do it. Organic feed, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water, uh, more than we do when we farm raise fish in, by the rivers in the U.S., Salmon escape, they mutate with the other salmon. You got monster salmon, they add pink and orange dye in the feed to make the, uh, the meat look orange. A bunch of bad stuff happens to some fiber range salmon. All natural organic feed in both Norway and Faroe Islands. They grow in these gigantic, literally twice the size of this little area would be 50,000 salmon, but we're talking about 150 feet deep of water. So all these salmon that start obviously as caviar's eggs and they grow. And then they actually move with tugboats, these nets, very slowly, so salmon aren't stressed at all, to the processing plant, where they used to use a vacuum cleaner and suck them up, but that last bit of sucking up stresses the salmon. They're like, what's that hoover? Ah, and they get stressed and the salmon's no good, right? It's not, it's not good. Now they smartly, someone thought of this, just put a wooden chute and had running water going the wrong way and the salmon swam upstream like their natural habitat. And they, of course, swim to their death, but shh, shh, don't tell them, don't tell them. Uh, don't tell this guy, he, he knows though. Um, so that's why if it's farm raised properly, it's delicious. I love wild Alaskan salmon for sashimi. I find it when you cook it, either you nail it perfectly or it gets dry because there's so much less fat in the wild but it's still equally good. For grovloxing and smoking, I'd like um, the Norwegian or the Faroe because you need fat when you smoke. 
Anything else? How much time do we have? I have 15 more minutes? I do? All right, let me finish playing this then. Where's my dim sum dipper? So here's our scallion, watercress pancake. We'll do eight slices. Who's born in 64 or 76 or 88? Yeah, you're dragons. Like me, like my wife, like my son. Who's a, who's a pig? This year, the year this year? This is a big year. This is the year of the golden pig, right? My mom is a golden pig. It happens once every 60 years. So this is probably the only time it's going to happen, considering she's 89. She's going to live to 149? Probably not. All right. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't salt them. I made that whole thing about making sure you salt it like french fries. So rookie air, honestly, when it first comes out, when it's still a little oily, is when you salt them. That's the only way salt sticks to french fries, onion rings, and scallion pancakes. But it'll still be pretty good. Wine. This? Champagne. Why? Everyone likes champagne. Champagne for breakfast? Perfect. Right? Your day goes so much better at work. Uh, be a car salmon rosé, you're going to get a raise. I'm telling you. It works every time. Sauvignon Blanc, I would say. A new, a new world. A New Zealand, Australian, South Africa would be great. There's a little bit of fattiness to this. There's the bitterness from the, um, um, from the watercress. You want that high acid to cut through the fattiness of the scallion pancake. I'm Chardonnay'd out, I'll be fully honest. I drank so much Chardonnay in the 80s. Um, California Chardonnays, the Newtons, the Kistlers, that. I can't do Chardonnay anymore, which is a shame, because there's still some good ones being made. Having said that, this would go really well with a French or a lightly oaked or non-oaked California Chardonnay, right? Um, but if you like Pinot Noir, or you like Gamay, or you like Shiraz, drink it. Don't let someone with an ashtray around their neck say, Monsieur, you must have the Chateau blah, blah, blah. No, you don't. He wants you to have that because it's 125 a bottle, right? You wanted the Boone's Farm. No, maybe not that. But <laughs> you, wanted, you wanted a red wine with your fish. Go for it. You're making the purchase, and nothing is going to explode in your mouth and kill you, right? This is just wine and food. So at the end of the day, let's not get too serious about this. This is just wine and food. It, isn't, it may not be the best match in the world, but if you like red wine and you like your fish with red wine, you're making the purchase. Buy the red wine, right? I mean, there's no, there is no right or wrong. Some people try to... Uh, the best mark of a good sommelier, a good restaurant waiter, is when they recommend a wine based on what you're eating and they recommend a bottle that's less expensive than the one you're thinking about. That's great service. When that happens to me, I tip them like 40%. Because that's like, they're really there for me to make my experience better, not just to make money. Not all waiters and all restaurateurs, we're not all mercenaries, right? We're actually true hospitality professionals. We want you to have an amazing time. And we want you to think, wow, that was a great value, because then guess what? You're going to come back, which is really the best thing. Everyone, everyone will go to every restaurant one time, but then you're done. If your restaurant's not busy on a Tuesday and a Monday night, that's the repeat. Those, that's your bread and butter, so to speak. Um, questions? Anyone else? Young man. Wait, say, give him the mic, please. Would you like any tips? Do you have any tips or tricks for young cookers or like beginners? Learn how to slice. <laughs> Don't, in all seriousness, I'm not, I've, I have, I've worked with lots of kids, right? I have two kids, so I worked with them a lot. It's like a full-time job, kids, Jesus. And, um, Read, read more cooking books than watching cooking shows. Read. Everyone, all of us, right? Remember those things called books? Oh, they're so awesome. No, you turn the page and there's more stuff. I mean, yeah, no, it's amazing. Because when you're watching a cooking show, although you should definitely watch mine, don't worry about, I mean like Rick, Rick Bullis, Ballas? Bayless, Bayless, yeah. And, yeah, and that other guy, Imarol, right? Mab. Um, when you watch a cooking show, you're entertained, which is our goal, but you don't 
focus on maybe the technique because you're so entertained by whatever, us throwing things around or whatever it is. When you're reading and there's a photo, you're learning technique. So read, 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 and then cook, cook, cook. That's all you have to do. Everyone here, everyone here is a cook. Some of you are really good and some of you are horrible, right? <laughs> thank God. If you're all good, we wouldn't have restaurants. So we love that you're not all good. And thank God because you need to buy that pan, that pressure cooker, and that thing, right? That whatever, circulator, right? But you only get better by cooking. And then when you cook, you have to have this. One of my requirements when I do any demo is spoons. Because you gotta taste, taste, taste the water, taste this, taste the sauce, taste, 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 taste. Because I've made this dish a thousand times, but I have not made it today. So I still had to taste it, and actually, it's pretty good. Um, and I and actually, I'm reminded of, of one of my jokes I say often, I apologize if you've heard this before, but when I do my show, I always say when I try my dish, oh, that's pretty good. Oh, it's good to go. Let's plate it up. So someone, some smart person, emailed me and says, hey, chef, what would you say when you're doing your show and you taste a dish and it was horrible? I'm like, huh, great question. I would take the dish, I would smile, I'd look right in the camera, and I would lie. <laughs> because I want you to buy my book. I'm not going to say it's horrible. I'm going to say it's delicious. And then buy my book. So... Taste, taste, taste. Because the most important ingredient is salt. Right? Um, Any version of salt. Soy sauce, Florida salt, doesn't matter what it is. That's the most important thing. And you can never tell something salty enough until you taste it. That's simple. She's got a question on what you just spoke about, actually. So you were talking about how salt is one of the most important ingredients. What would be your top five that we would have to have in our kitchen? Top five ingredients? That's the question. At, after salt, top five ingredients that I love to use or just in a general kitchen that I like to use? MSG. No, I'm kidding. Uh. Although, and I don't have it. I, I have never purchased MSG. It's not as bad as everyone says. It's a glutamate. It's naturally occurring in soy sauce. And 0.01% people in the world have an allergy to MSG. People think they do. They get a migraine. That was just bad Chinese food. It was too salty, bad Chinese food, and you wake up with a migraine, right? And also, David Chang has shakers of MSG at his restaurant instead of salt because you use less. So in some ways, MSG is better for you. It's crazy. So um, besides salt, anything in the allium group as an ingredient. So this is garlic, ginger, or sorry, garlic, onion, shallots, scallions. Something in the allium group. You can't make anything savory without allium, something like that. My, my two fats of choice, depending on use, is olive oil, grapefruit oil. I'm, I'm already over five. It's so hard. Five? Jesus. Um, if I had to pick a fat, butter. Of all the fats in the world, butter. Because I can make whipped cream out of butter. Or vice. I guess once it's butter, I can't do that. So maybe cream. Am I on an island? <laughs> is Giselle with me and Brady or what? Am I showing him how to throw a spiral? Is that how it is? And Giselle's showing me how to not throw a spiral? I don't know. Brady um, who? Brady Hill, yeah. We have a question. Um, ginger, because ginger is the best ingredient for savory and for sweet. Right? Think of all the wonderful ginger molasses cakes, whatnot. Ginger, like lemongrass, you can break up and rub on your skin. Mosquitoes won't bite you. Ginger you can eat for nausea if you're pregnant or seasick, whatnot. Ginger is a miracle. You will never die if you eat ginger every day, ever. Okay? That's four, five. Pinot Noir. Love it. So, easy. Easy. Or, or, or maybe a champagne, rosé champagne. One of the two. One Go. more question here. Okay. Yep. I have a two-part question. The first one is on the soup. Can we substitute the watercress for kale? Yes. Okay. But I don't, I don't make any money then. Okay. Also, on the, um, the pan the pot that you're frizing the um, salmon, Oh, there's one? a lot of yes. There's a lot of people trying to put less of the oil and they're yep. using the air fryers. What's your comments on the air fryers? The Simply Ming air fryers are a really nice product. <laughs> ah, there you go. Four quart, forty nine ninety five Technolon plus coating, fifteen hundred <laughs> watts of power. It forms a cyclone into the vid. The, for, that one. Um, I actually like air fryers. Do I use them at Blue Dragon, my restaurant, and have ten air fryers? No, I don't. 
do I let my, the, the reason I love air fryers so much is when my kid, they're 16 and 18 now, but when they were 10 and 12, they could cook because they could use the air fryer and have really no chance of burning down the house, right? So they can get like, we, we have, you know, pot stickers and dim sum and things. They could throw them in there. You could take your chicken fingers. I'm talking to my kids. My kids eat chicken fingers too. And yes, I used to drive through Wendy's with sunglasses and they're like, you're like, it's not, shut up, dude. Just drive. Give me, a, give me my fingers. Let's go. Good guy, isn't he? And uh, so air fryers have that great purpose. Um, it cooks fish really well. And, but what it doesn't add is fat, which is the point of air frying. Salmon, like this one, you can see how much fat. I easily could have cooked this salmon in a pan with no fat, right? Because salmon has plenty of fat. I would have started on the meat side down, though, too, because there won't be as much fat coming off the skin side as the meat side. Um, but it works, and, and just, you just have to keep an eye on it. Uh, for reheating an air fryer, is stupendous. But, uh, and if you've seen me do it on HSN, I mean, there's a lot of great things, including, it's amazing, one of the best things you can make in an air fryer, souffle. You can make a great souffle in two minutes in an air fryer, and perfect every time. It's unbelievable. You can only do one or two, unfortunately, right? Although now, I just saw El Fryer Grande over there, I and mean, you can fry half of Chicago. Um, but, but it works really well for souffles, and it works actually the best s'mores machine in the world. You take a graham cracker, a piece of chocolate, and a big old jumbo marshmallow, and you air fry it, it gets GB and D, golden brown delicious. You never dropped it into the fire. You don't have to worry about the stick. You don't get hair, smoky hair. You get a perfect s'mores out of an air fryer. So it has its great purposes. It cannot be your only cooking you know, machine or tool in your, in, your, in your house, though, especially if you live in New York or have a boat or an RV. Or the air fryers are great for that. Right, because there's no flame. Time for one more question. Do you have time for one more? I, I yeah, oh, sure. Okay. I have nothing to do. <laughs> oh, there we go. I don't know where I you are. Where are nice. you? Yeah, right here. Oh, hi. Nice, nice to meet you. Uh, I wanted to ask you your opinion on sous vide and cooking with sous vide. Do you yep. do any sous vide? I, I've I've cooked sous vide. Quick history: sous vide was invented at Cornell University like 80 years ago. And no one in America wanted to do it because it looked like bird's eye peas boil in a bag. So like, this is haute cuisine? No, no, we're not doing it. The French, like, hey, this stuff is great. We're going to call it sous vide. And the French then started getting one, two, and three Michelin stars using sous vide uh, technique. For those that may not know, it's vacuum packed or just in a Ziploc, too. You don't have to cryovac it, right? It used to be the cryovac machine is so expensive, which it is. And the sous vide is just a circulator that maintains a temperature that you want, 125.5, 135.8, whatever it is, depending on the meat and the protein you're cooking. It's an amazing way of getting perfectly cooked proteins every single time. And nowadays, you can just use a normal plastic bag and just use the, those big clips you do in the lawyer's office, those black clips. If you clip the bag to the side of your vessel, it could be this, it could be a plastic vessel, it doesn't matter. S grab Thomas Keller under pressure, it's probably one of the better or best sous vide book out there, but there's plenty of sous vide books. If you want perfect medium rare or medium or medium well beef or whatever it is, if you want infused chicken, you put garlic and olive oil and then you have your chicken in there and you can cook it, it's pretty much foolproof. What it doesn't do is give you texture. So I always take, if I was doing steak and whatnot, at the end I give it a quick sear because you like that crackling, sizzling texture that steak should have. But it's amazing. It'll be perfect medium, that perfect color all the way through, besides just the two edges that you just seared. Uh, so I'm a big fan of sous vide. Uh, but you have to be careful, right? The careful part, people talk about the botulisms and all this stuff. That only happens when you cryovac something that's not good, right? So if something's borderline, like the chicken smells a little bit, don't ever cryovac it, because then that, not, not, no air environment, bacteria will freaking triple, quadruple, and before you know you have an experiment, and then that experiment goes in your stomach, and then you lost a couple days. Um, but sous vide is great, especially for all of us restaurants that have banquets. You're trying to do 50 people, you know, beef tenderloin. You can literally set it and forget it. I wish I invented that quote. It's the best quote ever, but you can really do it with sous vide. Um, and one tip for everyone that does sous vide, start with warm, if not hot water. Don't burn your sous vide motor out by starting with cold water and getting it to 130. Start with 130 water and just let it keep it at 130. It'll, save, it'll, it'll add 10 years to your machine if you don't have it bring up cold water, right? 
I think I'm being kicked off. You guys, thank you very much. Please come. If you want to eat some of my food, I'm over at uh, Aroma Booth at 3 o'clock. I have a beautiful pork butt that's been cooking for six hours, and I'm slicing it up at 3 o'clock because we have this new dub where Aroma's Booth is... Come on, how good are we? Anyone? Anyone? I'll tell you. Where are my people? I know I have it here somewhere. Uh, Sandy, what's, what's the booth for Aroma? Please. 12,531. 12,531 Lakeside. 12,531 Aroma. I am doing a great rice peel off and this beautiful uh, sliced pork. So come by. If you guys want, I'll give you some business cards. If anyone wants to come to Blue Ginger or Blue, sorry, Blue Dragon, come on up. My email's on there. Just said we made it housewares, and I'll certainly get you a table and take some of your money. Hello, la la wait, la I'm going to say one more thing. Sorry, Denise. On My Heart is my charity, Family Reach. Ten seconds. Family Reach is the only national charity that financially helps families with cancer. We've all been touched by cancer. I've been touched really directly. A lot of us have been as well. The number one cause of personal bankruptcy in this country today is cancer. You get cancer, that's horrific, especially if it's your child. But the fact that you may end up homeless because you can't afford the cost of cancer, which is enormously high, it's not about Obamacare. Thank God there's health care. This is every other expense that happens, especially the mom stops working because a two-year-old can't get himself to clinic, to trial, to treatment then your income's been halved. So you could have a Harvard degree, make $100,000, but if your wife quits her job, you just went from 200 to 100, you could end up broke really quickly. So on the back of my card is information about family reach. So please, please help me out with that because everyone here is better off than a lot of other people that are on their way to homelessness because of cancer. So most importantly, season your food. Thank you. We'll see you at Aroma. Yeah. Love you, Chicago.